Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight for the announcement of our 2021 Excellence in Historic Preservation Award winners. I'm Frank Sanchez, and it's my honor to chair the Preservation League of New York State's Board of Trustees. To those of you who are already members and supporters of the League, uh, thank you for everything that you do uh, to stand up for historic preservation in New York State. For those of you who are not yet familiar with our statewide work, we're excited for you to get to know the League tonight and also to get to know this year's awards winners. I want to thank especially the Arthur F. and Alice E. Adams Charitable Foundation for their support of tonight and for their support of many other preservation awards uh, over the years. We're really thankful for them to be for being such generous and uh, consistent supporters. Thank you very much. This is the second year that we brought our excellence awards online. And while we miss obviously our in-person gatherings, uh, we're excited to reach so many more people through this virtual medium. Our award winners are truly deserving of statewide attention and we're honored to amplify their work through tonight's event and over the coming weeks uh, through additional online uh, outreach. And I encourage you, if you enjoy tonight's program, please tell your friends they can see this evening's presentation on our website whenever they wish. This year, our jury recognized winners in every one of our award categories. And so we'll be celebrating preservation projects, organizations, a publication, and an outstanding individual. We hope you are as inspired uh, by them as we were and are. Please welcome to the screen now, uh, Charlotte Worthy, a fellow board member and chair of the awards committee and league president, Jay DiLorenzo. Wait, hi, hi guys. <laughs> uh, Charlotte and Jay will be dividing the presentation of the awards between them. And it promises as it always is to be a really good show. As you are no doubt familiar with Zoom, we may encounter some technical difficulties um, as we move along through our presentation. If we do, please bear with us and thanks in advance for your patience and understanding. And now it's my pleasure to turn the evening over to our host, and I will see you again at the end of the show. Thank you, Frank. The Excellence Awards is a cornerstone program for the League. Since 1984, we've been recognizing the best of the best in historic preservation, and this year is no different. At its core, the awards are about people who are using preservation to build stronger neighborhoods, create local jobs, provide affordable housing, open our eyes to overlooked history, save the places that are special to all of us, and inspire others to do the same. The 10 award winners you will hear about tonight are shining examples of what historic preservation can and should be. Yes, Jay, we have a great mix of winners this year. It's not every year that the awards jury selects winners in every category. Tonight, we'll hear about vacant buildings becoming affordable housing, adaptive reuse projects that support local arts initiatives, a preservationist whose decades of work has a profound effect on the Adirondack region and beyond, a nonprofit centering social justice and fighting against systemic racism in preservation, a great example of the power of social media to support the preservation movement, and truly excellent examples of historic buildings being brought back to their former glory. The 10 honorees this year are strikingly different, but they all remind us that preservation is about people as much about as it is about our built, built environment. Our award winners are making their community stronger through their efforts, stewarding the past into the future. On behalf of the awards jury, I just wanna say how inspiring it always is to read through the nominations and to get to know our awards winning projects. I was honored to serve as the committee chair again this year and I want to thank my fellow jury members, Andrew Capitman, Jay DeLorenzo, Georgette Greer-Key, Gregory Long, 
Richard Maitino, Frank Sanchez, and Arita Warren. You all put such care into your review of each project and it's a privilege to work with you. Let's turn to the winning projects and I'm pleased to present this year's Excellence in Historic Preservation Award winners. The question really is, are the buildings just going to continue to deteriorate until they just demolish and fall apart on their own, or is somebody going to do something? The restoration took uh, 24 months. It was a two-year construction project because there are 70 separate buildings. Well, first of all, this property was going to foreclosure and it is very likely that if we didn't intercede someone else would have bought these properties at auction. It is very likely that the vast majority of our tenants would have had to leave their apartments permanently. Uh, we made the promise that all tenants who wanted to stay could return and that their rents would not increase upon their return. Properties like Clinton Avenue Apartments and most of what home leasing does, it's not just an apartment, but it's an affordable apartment. And so tenants are usually entering the best apartment they've ever lived in at maybe the best rent that they've ever had. So it changes their lives, not uh, just because of quality housing, but also affordability. In my experience in upstate New York, all the communities that have suffered over the last several decades from disinvestment are coming back and they're always coming back on the basis of historic preservation. When I walk into the new cap rep space, I'm kind of amazed because it's better than what I imagined. It was a bakery originally with tall ceilings and, and huge beams and huge columns, wooden columns. To have the flavor of that still exist, yet to sit in the space I'm sitting in, which is a theater that is immersive. It, 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 you, you can't help but go, wow, a, a play here is going to get your attention and keep it. And to have all that together in one building is lovely. This building could easily have been demolished um, the UPH building could easily have been demolished because that it had actually imploded and its roof had collapsed. But you could never replace what that building was. You could never replace its relationship to the light, its, its windows. Um, this building's materials were irreplaceable. And if we could celebrate what we did so well 150 years ago or 170 years ago, at the same time as we celebrate a, new, a rebirth of the purpose of these properties, that's to me a sustainable economic development. So really, it's the heart of our mission that these properties represent. We like to say that we like our buildings to feel like the community's living rooms, open to all, and open for the kinds of conversations that might be difficult for any of our communities to have.
when I walk into this beautiful space, I feel like I'm stepping back in time. This is our, our culinary and event center. We have our uh, hospitality management, uh, culinary and event management uh, programs offered here. Uh, so it's primarily classroom and uh, space and lab space for culinary. The historic renovation architect was thrilled <laughs> to find the original blueprints in the time capsule, which was buried in the far corner of the building over here behind me, through those glass doors and off in the corner. After serving as the historic public library for a hundred years, uh, it's now being used as an educational facility once again. It, it's, come, it's come home to its roots. Uh, so much imagery here regarding the history of, of the building and the area and the college. Uh, and it, it kind of comes full circle uh, right here in this building. Recent events and events all my life point to the importance of remembering and honoring our history. Uh, and this is a physical uh, manifestation of remembering and, and honoring our history, which is, which is so important to today and, and to all our futures. You know, it's wonderful to come inside and see the people using the spaces who live here and enjoying um, and taking pride in the, the building. There are three buildings. We've created 28 apartments plus eight art studios and commercial space on the first floor of the two buildings that are connected on Lake Street. In this building there is a specially wonderful window trim and a lot of nice features that we were able to maintain and celebrate. We have skylights that were used in bedroom spaces that I think make the building very unique. Of course the wooden floors and the brick. I think people really love seeing all those details. I'm really proud of creating space that people said, this isn't market rate space. That's a fun comment to hear because I think everybody should have the opportunity to live in beautiful space. I think fundamental to being a good historic preservationist is to follow your curiosity and to follow it wherever it leads. One of the things I think that Arch has brought to the Adirondacks over the last 30 years is to really raise people's awareness about the beauty and the importance of its architecture and have brought a greater sense of stewardship among the people that live here. We saw very early on that we wanted to change people's hearts and minds and the only way to really change people's hearts and minds was to educate them, was to shine a light on things and the only really way to do that was through was through education and so I can see that we have elevated this sense of appreciation and interest and stewardship in the region's built environment that makes preservation work going forward much more likely and possible. I'm very interested, we're very interested in the stories that buildings have to tell, in the history that, that buildings connect us to, but I'm way more interested in what buildings can do for the vitality of, the com of a community today and going forward. That's what the possibility is for thousands of buildings across the region, including this one, bringing life, bringing vitality back to Adirondack communities. 
believe in and love the place where you live. A lot of the work we've been doing is to teach people that they're already preservationists, they just didn't know it. PBN has really reshaped how we look at preservation from an equity and justice lens that's really become the way that we measure and value the work that we're doing. Not just are we making more landmarks, are we protecting more buildings, but are we expanding how we tell the story of Buffalo and Western New York? Are we protecting places that were previously vulnerable? Are we making sure that everyone's story is being told and the places that everyone values are the ones that we're protecting. We also hope that the movement will really embrace this idea of anti-racism, will really embrace the tenets of inclusivity and of access. And we do see a lot of movement uh, in preservation towards that. And we hope that organizations like Preservation Buffalo Niagara and other organizations across the country that are really committed to this work can be models for other organizations. We love new development. We just want to make sure that the places that people already love, that are already special and important, are part of that new Buffalo. We want a bright, vibrant future. And in order for that to happen, we really need to understand how we've gotten to the place where we are. And we really need to make sure that everyone feels at home, that everyone feels welcome and supported in this place so that we can get to that future place together. This is a very iconic building at the centre of this small hamlet of Waylandsburg. Everyone who lives in the area drives by frequently. They know the building. The building is owned by the Waylandsburg Grange Association, which is, which is actually just across the street. We're sort of thinking about it as a, as a centre of craft activity. Um, but also as a community centre and centre of activities uh, and broader than that as well. It's just really magical because it's the product of collective volunteer work and so there's a tremendous sense of pride and accomplishment in the whole building and to have people to walk from one end of the, to the other, to have folks at work from the blacksmith to the woodworking shop. Um, it's just, it's really fantastic transformation. Winning this award from the from the Preservation League and the prestige that that brings with it will help get the word out, will help inspire others with this, with, with, with this vision of what's, um, of what's possible and the, and the tremendous, tremendous benefits that come, that come with it. Historic preservation is critical to our mission. It's so rewarding coming into the building. 50 years ago, our board actually considered tearing down the building. It had been closed from the 70s through the 90s. Seeing this now, like it was as close to we could get it to 1911 is just, is great. And seeing the building used, especially for so many different things, is particularly rewarding. Greenwood's purpose is to tell stories and to preserve history. A building like this, built by Warren and Wetmore, who did Grand Central Station, many other buildings, very important to keep. Thinking that this building could ever have been torn, torn down in the 70s is it's unthinkable. It's a beautiful structure in a, in a beautiful setting 
and it's part of Greenwood's history, now New York City landmark, and we're proud to preserve it. Our future is not safe if we don't remember what happened in the past, and that goes for buildings, that goes for everything. There's never a day where I don't have a sense of the transcendent when I walk through our sanctuary or when I stand on our rooftop and I look at that bell tower and hear those bells. And I believe that uh, that use of the space has created uh, a sense of purpose and meaning for many people. It's inspired us to continue to rebuild our congregation. This building was originally built in 1922 by John D. Rockefeller Jr. One of the distinguishing features of the building at the beginning was the bell tower that Rockefeller built, and he installed a carolin of 53 bells, which had been the largest in the world at the time. But when the Baptist congregation moved up to Riverside, Rockefeller had the bells removed as well. So this bell tower stood empty for nearly 90 years. But over the last 15 years, we've been seeking to rebuild our congregation. Preservation is uh, core to who we are as a church and what we're trying to accomplish. So as we seek to rebuild the congregation, we needed to rebuild this beautiful sanctuary. Now that this facade has been uh, restored and the stained glass windows have been completely renovated and we took down the bell tower stone by stone, repaired the, the steel inside and then rebuilt it completely and put in a new carolin of 50 bells in the bell tower. We have uh, restored this building to its original grandeur and it's a, a source of inspiration, I think, not only to our congregation but also to the neighborhood. We, as the current individuals here on Earth now, have the opportunity to preserve and promote the past so that it has a future for the next generations who come after us. I started the page back in 2012 when I got my first iPhone. Uh, I downloaded the Instagram account and I started to go out and take pictures of things that I love, which basically is the city in which I live. A lot of the times when I do a story on a house that's unoccupied or abandoned, I get a lot of people asking me why, why is it like this, what happened here? And the answers are all in our past policies, which had an impact on the most marginalized members of our society. And so the page actually ties in the accurate history of what has occurred over time in our community. I think the page gives us, the residents, a sense of pride and purpose um, in the community that these buildings, these homes are not just things of the past, but that they are still existing, that we have an opportunity to change things for the better. I love what I do, and I love that others love what I do. So it keeps me going. Congratulations to this year's winners. There's so many great preservation efforts happening across our state. And tonight's honorees cover so much of it, from Brooklyn to the North Country. As you saw in that wonderful video, all of tonight's honorees have a truly remarkable story to tell. So now that we've got you introduced to them, Charlotte and I are going to dive a bit deeper into each one. 
With that, let's get started. Our first award of the evening recognizes the restoration of the Clinton Avenue Apartments, which sit just down the street from where I am here in Albany. A long history of neglect for these row houses was leading to their imminent loss until they were saved and brought back to active use. This project is remarkable for the sheer scale of it. 70 individual buildings spread across a one mile span in the historic Arbor Hill neighborhood of Albany, a neighborhood that desperately needs this type of large scale reinvestment in good quality housing. When home leasing acquired the portfolio of properties in 2017, it was in foreclosure with eight buildings condemned and more than half the units vacant. Having been restored, this group of historic row houses now provides over 200 apartments with 40 specifically identified for supportive housing, thanks to their program partners at the Paul Properties. It was a tremendous two year undertaking to bring these buildings back to life. The apartments are high quality with energy efficiency prioritized throughout. The project meets the New York State Housing Finance Agency's green guidelines, which sets high standards for energy use and efficiencies. Restoring historic housing stock to create affordable housing is one of the most sustainable ways of addressing our current housing crisis. And this project is such a great example of that. With a project this big, collaboration needed to be prioritized. The team that was assembled from home leasing to preservation studios was committed to doing right by both the buildings and the people who called them home. Community outreach was a big part of this project's success and we applaud all involved. Assembly member John McDonald also wanted to send his congratulations. Hi, it's Assembly Member John McDonald, and I first of all want to thank the Preservation League of New York State for their great work, but also to congratulate the Clinton Avenue Historic Apartments uh, in their recognition. It's been a joy to work with the entities in regards to not only the funding, but watching the work go on on what was really one of the most majestic streets in the city of Albany. Uh, thank you to all the partners that made this a reality as we see beautiful historic residential buildings brought back to life here in the capital city. This is such a great example of the way historic preservation can help to provide essential resources like quality, affordable housing. Yeah, this project by Home Leasing and its partners has not only changed the lives of its residents, uh, but it's also helped to build a stronger Albany neighborhood. Our next award winner really impressed press the jury with not one, but two projects. We're very excited to recognize Proctor's Collaborative, a leader in performing arts and regional economic development efforts. My video is coming on. There I am. Uh, for their, both the Capitol Repertory Theater and Universal Preservation Hall reinvigorated vacant buildings to create state-of-the-art performance spaces. Undertaking two projects like this simultaneously is nothing short of extraordinary. In Albany, not far from our first project award on Clinton Avenue, the REP, as the Capitol Repertory Theater is known, has transformed an industrial building into an immersive theater. Much of the charm of the old building has been retained from wood floors and timber beams to the restored cast iron storefront. Each year, the rep serves over 35,000 people, plus over 10,000 students through education programs, not to mention producing a world premiere play in its role as an incubator for emerging creative professionals. Their new home will help them better serve those audiences as well as the community they are now a part of. Universal Preservation Hall, is a much different kind of project, but no less impressive. Looking at it, there's no question as to its original purpose, but UPH is a massive building and it had been condemned since 2000 before the community rallied to save it from demolition. Proctor's commitment to bringing it back to life has ensured this treasure will be an asset to the city of Saratoga Springs for years to come. 
special care was paid to issues of accessibility, which is often difficult with historic buildings. But making sure the spaces are welcoming to all is deeply important to the work that Proctors does. With a focus on education, civic engagement, and economic development, Proctors Collaborative is a vital asset to the wider capital Saratoga region and beyond. Two formerly vacant buildings are now part points of pride for their neighborhoods and economic engines that will support the region's creative economy. These projects also show how adaptive performance spaces can be equally at home in a former church and a former industrial building. And as he did for the Clinton Avenue project, Assembly Member McDonald has sent his congratulations for the rep. So congratulations to the Proctor's Collaborative and the new home of Capitol Rep Theater here in North Albany. It's been a wonderful experience of watching this probably for a long and forgotten building be revitalized. Uh, I've been very fortunate to be there for the groundbreaking, but also the reopening. And we're very excited about the opportunities it brings to North End of Albany, but more excited about the fact that a historic building in this city has new life. Once again, correct, congratulations to the Proctors Collaborative. Yeah, and I should mention that this is not the first award uh, for the Proctors Collaborative. They received an award from the league in 2008 for their flagship theater in Schenectady, meaning that they have been awarded for all three of their historic spaces. It's particularly encouraging to see the work they did to bring new life to Universal Preservation Hall at a time when so many of New York's houses of worship are facing an uncertain future. Uh, now to the Southern tier and what was formerly the Binghamton Public Library. This Beaux-Arts style Carnegie Library opened in downtown Binghamton in 1904, serving as the city's library for nearly a century. After the library moved to a larger space, the Carnegie Library sat vacant from 2000 to 2016, falling into a state of disrepair. This is something that we've seen in a number of communities as libraries outgrow their historic spaces. But a wonderful new use was found. Through a complete rehabilitation, this historic building has been transformed into a state-of-the-art culinary and event center for SUNY Broome Community College. Maintaining its function as a center for education, the former library now features technologically advanced culinary, hospitality, and event amenities, allowing for the very best training for its students. It also features painstakingly restored historic features, like the original tile floors. Now in rehabilitating this historic space, SUNY Broome has preserved an important piece of the city's history while making it relevant and functional for modern use. Creating effective ventilation and facility functions while keeping the historic character of the building required innovative design. This ultimately led to the construction of a new addition annexed to the back of the building where the kitchens and the elevator are located. This was an incredibly difficult adaptive reuse project completely reconfiguring this historic building's use. The space is now a model for other culinary educational facilities and a true preservation success story. You know, at one point, there were almost 1,700 Carnegie libraries around the country. And while many still exist, hundreds have been adaptively reused, like this one. Yeah, they really are community landmarks. And it's great to see this one in Binghamton, given an important new use. And now to the Finger Lakes and the Arbor Gerard and Carroll Street Warehouse Rehabilitation Project in Elmira. This exciting rehabilitation of three historic buildings has created a mix of affordable housing, art studios and commercial space that has been a real boost to the city of Elmira, which was an important transportation hub in the 1800s. Following the flood of 1972 caused by Hurricane Agnes, an estimated 40% of Elmira's commercial space was lost to misguided attempts at redevelopment. These buildings are survivors of that time. Threatened more recently with the possibility of demolition, they have instead been reborn 
and are fulfilling the need for affordable and creative space as part of a vibrant historic city. With great skill, the architects restored and protected historic features like the original transom lights you see here, while incorporating modern upgrades that make these spaces both energy efficient and beautiful. Instead of eyesores in the heart of downtown Elmira, these buildings are now a point of pride in their community, welcoming residents and visitors alike who are reminded of the city's important past and its bright future. This project involved nearly 30 separate entities, which required a high level of collaboration. Frequent calls and discussions with state agencies, project partners and supporters was fundamental to its success. The result is a project that breathes new life into three historic buildings while helping to revitalize Elmira's downtown. Historic buildings like these provide such a great foundation for housing and spaces for artists and other creatives. We've seen it throughout the state. And this project also illustrates how to provide quality affordable housing in a walkable setting. And as Elise said in the video, affordable housing can and should be an asset to the community. Our next award recognizes an individual who has been hands down the most influential preservationist in the North Country for decades, Stephen Engelhardt, the outgoing executive director of Adirondack Architectural Heritage. One is hard pressed to find a more genuine, collaborative or enthusiastic preservationist. He is passionate about the built environment and the peoples whose stories these places tell. But he is equally excited about the role buildings from our past can play in building a stronger future. I've been fortunate to count Stephen as a colleague and friend for many years. His impact on the Adirondacks truly cannot be overstated. For 27 years, Stephen has served as executive director of ARCH, the nonprofit historic preservation organization for New York's 6 million Adirondack, 6 million acre Adirondack Park and the surrounding region, which comprises 12 counties and 102 towns and villages. Since 1990, Stephen has strengthened preservation efforts in the Adirondacks, bringing to light the role that its diverse and often underappreciated communities have played in shaping statewide heritage. In a region where most of us can't help but focus on the natural beauty, Stephen has opened our eyes to ways that residents have made a home in their mostly wild surroundings, through their buildings, their bridges, and their byways. Upon his retirement at the end of 2021, Stephen will no doubt remain an ally for saving the places that matter in the Adirondacks. From his work to preserve Great Camp Santanoni, to his dedication to the region's vernacular architecture, and his enduring commitment to the people who call the Adirondacks home, Stephen is truly deserving of this statewide recognition. Assembly member Billy Jones agrees, and he sent along a citation in, Stephen, in Stephen's honor. Let's take a look. Hi, Steve. Congratulations on your retirement for all the excellent work that you have done for the area and the region over the years. I have a New York State Assembly citation for you, and I'm going to take the time here to read it to you. Well deserved. And again, thank you for all your service. New York State Assembly citation. Whereas a great state is only as great as those individuals who give exemplary service to their community, whether through participation in voluntary programs, through unique achievement, in their profession or other endeavors or simply through a lifetime of good service. Whereas such service, which is truly the lifeblood of the community and the state, so often goes unrecognized and therefore unrewarded. And whereas Mr. Engelhart served on the Adirondack Architectural Heritage as a founding board member in 1990 before being their first executive director in 1994. Whereas Mr. Engelhart worked with people and organizations around the North Country to restore and preserve historical buildings and sites via projects and advocacy. And whereas Mr. Engelhart has been instrumental in the success of the community, as well as the Adirondack Architectural Heritage, now therefore be it resolved that I, as a duly elected member of the New York State Assembly, recognize that in Stephen Engelhart, he should be commended for his 31 years of outstanding service 
to the Adirondack Architectural Heritage upon his retirement for receiving the Preservation League of New York State's 2021 Excellence Award. In Stephen Engelhart, we have an outstanding citizen who is worthy of the esteem of both his community and the great state of New York. Congratulations, Stephen. Thank you, and I appreciate working with you through the years. You know, I love what Stephen said in the video. Good preservationists follow their curiosity wherever it leads, and that's so true, and you really never know where it might take you. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And as for Stephen, it's taken him in some incredible directions over the years. Congratulations on your retirement, Stephen. And we know Arch will be in good hands with the league's former vice president, Aaron Tobin, who has assumed the role of executive director with your retirement. Thanks, Jay. And congratulations, Stephen. Our next award winner is an important colleague organization for the Preservation League in Western New York, Preservation Buffalo, Niagara. While Buffalo is known for its treasure trove of high style architect design buildings, the region has another side. Long affected by redlining, urban renewal, government sanctioned erasure, disinvestment and segregation, preservation was seen as largely ineffective or irrelevant to many community members. Five years ago, PBN began an intentional journey to change the dominant narrative about who preservation serves and what landscapes are worthy of protection. From their revolving loan fund for low-income residents of local historic districts to their tours and workshops, PBN is working to create a fully inclusive preservation movement addressing systemic racism and preservation and uplifting narratives around women, immigrants, and the LGBTQ plus communities. PBN is a tremendous resource for Western New York. Their commitment to telling the full story of the Buffalo region and making preservation relevant to a much wider cross-section of their community is something that should be emulated by other preservation groups wherever they happen to be. Through a wide range of programs, the PBN team is having a profoundly positive effect on Buffalo, and we can't wait to see what they do next, and the league is honored to work alongside them. It really has been inspiring to see PBN's evolution over the last few years. Indeed, and for anyone who is interested in learning more about their Eliza Quirk project and their work on Buffalo's East Side, they will be presenting two fascinating sessions during this week's New York Statewide Preservation Conference. So make sure you're registered for that. Thanks, Charlotte. And now back to the Adirondacks for a project that exemplifies grassroots preservation. Wickham's Garage sits just across, across the road from the Whalensburg Grange Hall, a volunteer-driven nonprofit arts and community center. Wickham's had sat vacant for years before the Grange bought it in 2018. After the Grange took ownership of the long vacant garage, they organized a group of dedicated volunteers to plan, design, and carry out an adaptive rehabilitation of the space. This was a challenging project. The garage had no insulation, primitive wiring, most of it was unheated, and it had been badly damaged by years of neglect. The conception, planning, and construction work was done by volunteers, both skilled and unskilled, who spent thousands of hours transforming the building into commercial workshops, a retail store, ceramic studio, and mixed use space for classes, performances, and other community activities. The repurposing of this disused building has created space for new businesses in an economically challenged rural region. Throughout the building, windows, doors, and other features were reused wherever possible. The Whitcomb's lettering has been preserved on the exterior and the colorful updated facade echoes key elements of the original. While some of the original design was altered during the project, this is truly grassroots preservation in action. And the, and the act of making the building functional was a higher priority than keeping the structure exactly as it was. Without the support of committed local volunteers, Whitcomb's garage would surely have been lost. Thanks to their work, 
this derelict garage has been transformed into a vibrant center of economic revival and community engagement. This project is such a good example of a community deciding for itself what should be saved. They knew a community landmark when they saw it, and they clearly felt that if the building was allowed to disappear, it would be lost for everyone. Yeah, I agree. Whitcombs doesn't need a landmark designation from someone else. It is a waypoint in the landscape of the Adirondacks. And instead of losing it, the community decided to give it a new lease on life. Thanks, Jay. And our next two winners are both in New York City and both involved great work by Walter B. Melvin Architects. First in Brooklyn, the iconic chapel in the National Historic Landmark Greenwood Cemetery. Designed in 1911 by the architectural firm of Warren and Wetmore, the neo-Gothic design featured 41 carved window openings with figurative stained glass. A white tiled Guastavino interior above the inner dome reflects daylight from the colorful stained glass windows. The interior is finished in a combination of natural limestone and cast stone sculpted in low relief. In 2018, a comprehensive restoration of the building interior included the stained glass windows, was begun with Walter B. Melvin Architects leading the building restoration and Julie L. Sloan leading the stained glass work. One particularly challenging task came halfway through the restoration when water tests revealed the waterproofing concealed beneath the limestone slab was failing. Greenwood directed the project team to proceed with the enormous task of replacing the waterproofing membrane. A crane was employed to carefully remove the massive limestone slabs weighing in at nearly 40 tons, temporarily storing them and redepositing them on newly waterproof substrate, a monumental undertaking. The restored building once again provides visitors to Greenwood a peaceful sanctuary in which to rest, contemplate, and remember, and will help support its recent use as a home for art and music programming. We are happy to see the investment made here to preserve this historic space and steward it well into the future. I think it's worth noting that this restoration work continued through the pandemic, keeping people working safely during a very challenging time. That's true. And it goes for many of the projects we're honoring tonight. Restoration projects like these can be challenging under the best of circumstances. So to see such successes accomplished during the past two years really is inspiring. And from Brooklyn to Manhattan, our next winner is the exterior restoration of Central Presbyterian Church. Located on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, Central Presbyterian Church was constructed between 1920 and 1922. Despite the high quality of the original materials and craftsmanship, time eventually took its toll on the church. As a result, the church has been shrouded in sidewalk bridging for years littered with fragments of broken limestone. Almost 100 years after its construction, the congregation embarked on a restoration project. What began as a triage approach to repairs ultimately became a comprehensive restoration effort. The facades were cleaned and deteriorated stonework was repaired or replaced in kind. All the stained glass windows were removed, completely restored with new lead and reinstalled. Perhaps most impressive, the limestone bell tower was completely disassembled from the steel frame and reconstructed with improved detailing. Long empty, a new carillon of 50 bronze bells, which were cast in France, was installed inside the restored bell tower. Historic churches across the country are struggling to maintain their buildings and this restoration project is a wonderful example of a congregation rallying to preserve its history. The craftsmanship on display here is truly excellent. And the rehabilitated facade will not only be a point of pride for the church, but anyone walking down Park Avenue. The rebuilding of the core of the bell tower at Central Presbyterian is a good example of the extensive work that's often needed, work that will never be seen by the public, to keep these important buildings standing. Yes, I, I often see this as an architect and sometimes it's hard to understand 
that a building is deteriorating and in danger of being lost if you can't see the deterioration from the finishes. And as an architect and preservationists and also custodians of these buildings, we must go to the very core of the structure and address those issues as early as we can. A solid maintenance program is the key to this. Thanks, Charlotte. And now for our last award of the night, the Instagram page at Syracuse History curated by David Haas. We meet awards in our publication category many times over the years, but this is the first time we're recognizing an Instagram page. I think that speaks to the work of David Haas, who has been posting as Syracuse history since, nine, since 2012. David's work is dedicated to the preservation of the neighborhoods and narratives of Syracuse. Through Instagram, he has used social media to expose tens of thousands of people, both local and not, to the history of the city of Syracuse and the central New York region. With his photos, he's sharing the values of historic pre preservation through imagery and storytelling. Although at Syracuse history lives online, its effects can also be felt in the real world. In 2019, for example, preservationists from around Syracuse called on the Common Council to, uh, to approve the designation of the Angeloro building to the city's list of protected sites, which includes buildings of historic or architectural significance. David leveraged his platforms, 45,000 followers to get the word out, encouraging them to express their objection to an application for the demolition of the 115 year old building. Under that proposal, the building's beautifully preserved architecture and its well-known small family run Mexican restaurant it housed would have been lost. The building was granted a, protect, a protected site status and continues to live on as part of the culturally diverse Syracuse Northside community. Thanks in part to David's storytelling and the hundreds of messages of support that flooded the Syracuse Common Council following his advocacy. The work that David Haas has done through uh, Syracuse history is truly an excellent example of how social media can be used to advocate for historic places. His reach goes far beyond the borders of central New York, introducing people all over the country to the city of Syracuse and its history. We talk a lot about how preservation is as much about the future as it is about the past. David's work embodies the future of preservation using a new tool like Instagram to reach different audiences. Absolutely. There's a wave of younger preservationists standing up for our shared cultural heritage, and we're excited to recognize the role that David and others like him play in this work. Congratulations to all of our winners. And my personal thanks to Jay, Frank, and the Preservation Lead staff, especially Christina Hingle, for guiding the awards nomination and jury processes. Katie Peace for putting together tonight's program and the digital content to follow. And Mary Lucas for helping us run tonight's show. And thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed hearing about all these incredible projects. And I encourage you to stay tuned to our social media channels for more about all of them over the coming days and weeks. I don't know if anybody can hear me here. We can. Uh, yes, we can. My video is not on. It says the host has stopped my video. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, you can talk anyway, Frank. You can there talk, I am. Go Thank ahead. You, host. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm back, as sure. promised. Um, and I want to add my congratulations to this evening's Excellence Awards winners. Um, they're really an impressive and completely diverse group. They're, that's an amazing group of, of projects and people. It's been a rough couple of years to say the least. So we especially relish uh, being able to celebrate successes like this when we can. And tonight's winners uh, remind us how preservation really does bring people together. Uh, at the very least, you saw all the people involved 
in the project slides, which were great to see. Evenings like this don't happen uh, spontaneously, and I want to thank, again, the people who participated directly. Charlotte, thank you. The awards committee, thank you. Jay, thank you. And of course, the winners and the league staff who worked hard behind the scenes uh, to put it all together. I also want to express our appreciation again to the Arthur F. and Alice E. Adams Charitable Foundation for supporting tonight's program. I'd like to encourage all of you uh, to join the league and our colleagues over the next couple of days for the New York State uh, Statewide Preservation Conference, which is going on now, uh, virtual again this year. The statewide conference is bringing really dynamic speakers from across the country for two days of engaging sessions. And right after this program, the conference cocktails and conversations uh, will kick off. So if you haven't already, uh, please register for it. I'll be there and we'll drop a link to the conference into this chat. The league team uh, is busy working on our programming lineup for 2022, and I hope you'll stay tuned uh, to more interesting and informative webinars, preservation roundtables, and author talks over the coming months. And I want to give a shout out to our Excelsior Society, which offers even more special programming for those members. I hope you'll look into uh, becoming an Excelsior yourself. And with that, thank you all for joining us tonight. Have a lovely evening, and I'll see you at the statewide conference. Good night. Good night. Cheers, Brad. Good night.